Hi, everybody. So uh, I didn't start out in information security. I actually started out as a lowly system administrator, but fortunately was at a company that once I started to express some interest in security, they gave me some room to grow there. And as soon as I realized what was, was going on, I was like, I need to read everything that's going on. So I started looking at information security news, and quite frankly, I was overwhelmed. Like, because we're looking at people who are figuring out ways to exfil data from an air-gapped computer wrapped in a Faraday cage, and somebody knows the precise JavaScript parser used in Windows Defender to trigger a bug just by dropping on a file. And I was sitting and I was like, do I need to become the expert of all of the things in order to make actual security work? Uh, and what I've, what I've found as I've been in here longer is that while those shiny types of news stories might be what gets attention, uh, that what gets the biggest bang for the buck is security fundamentals. It's, it's, it's doing the day-to-day -day things that are going through. So for those of you who are relatively new to information security, great, this is an awesome talk for you. What I hope you get out of this is realizing that you don't have to know all of the things in order to be good at information security. For those of you who've been in this, uh, uh, this space for a while, nothing that I'm going to talk about here is going to be mind-blowing, all right? But I want to explain going through this by documenting actual attacks that have happened against me and my company. I think the red team side of the equation does a really great job of sharing proof of concept codes or documenting vulnerabilities, but that blue side of the equation of actual defender experience, I don't see as much of. And so I wanted to do more sharing with the community. So this is not selecting <laughs> the best post-quantum TLS cipher suite kind of talk. I'm so glad that there are people in our information security uh, community that do that kind of thing. Uh, and I'm much more glad that they make Nmap scripts and various scanners online with simple little letter grades so that mere mortals like myself can be making informed decision. Uh, but this is gonna be a talk that's about fundamentals. So I'm Benjamin, I do security at Lending Club. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna walk through some actual attacks that I've needed to defend against. We're gonna start with the broad and general, and then we're gonna narrow down into some things that are specific and targeted. All right, so throughout this, here's my three fundamental questions. Here's the three fundamental things that I want you to, to be asking yourself when you see new attacks. First is, can I see it? Two, can I throw away what is obviously garbage, okay? And then three, can I make whatever is less, more expensive, for an attacker, all right? Can I see it? Can I throw away garbage? Can I make it more expensive? All right, that's our framework for all of these attacks. So let's start out with some door knockers. I call them door knockers. Some other people call them spray and pray. The basic idea here is imagine if you would the worst home burglar known to man. They can't pick any locks. They can't disable any alarm systems. All they do is go to every single house in the neighborhood, knock on the door to see if somebody's home, and jiggle the handle to see if it's locked. And if the door is locked, they'll just go on to the next house. But if nobody's home and the door is open, oh, we'll go inside and steal your TV. Same idea here. There is absolutely zero customization involved in these attacks. It's hitting absolutely everyone with a public address on the internet just to see what's happening. All right, so this one came from Hong Kong. And before I show the actual attack, I want to talk a little bit about Hello World. Anybody with any but a kind of programming experience, the first time you might be learning a new language, you might start out with something that looks like this. Doesn't do much good, just shows hello world on the screen, nothing super fancy. Like there's no multi-billion dollar startups disrupting the hello world industry. But it just is a little simple thing that says, okay, I know what I'm trying to do actually works. And in my experience, one of the things that I see as an attacker hello world is trying to get or cat out Etsy password. And I think there's a couple of reasons why Etsy password is, a, is a, a happy choice. First, it's in the same location in most major Linux distributions. And second of all, for the system to actually be working, it has to be world readable. So it doesn't matter if the vulnerability they're trying to exploit gets them root on the box or some low level privileged account, they should still be able to get Etsy password. Also, if they do get it back, they get a bunch of useful information that's helpful for identifying and fingerprinting uh, what's going on. It's, it's going to be a, a user list, and you can figure out things like, oh, is an Apache web server installed? If the Apache web server is installed, there's going to be an Apache user in here. And is that user called www-data? Is it called Apache 2? Is it called HTTPD? That lets you know, how is this an Ubuntu system? Maybe this is a Debian-based system. It's just a really simple, like, nice first step to see if it works. 
All right, so let's take a look at the attack. So this is the start of our attack here. It's a really simple directory traversal. So what you see there, that dot, dot, back. Oh, can you see the red in there? Somewhat, okay, it's hard to read from this angle, but glad you guys can see it. So dot, dot, slash just means, hey, go back a directory. And so the idea of directory traversal is, hey, if the person serving up a website hasn't locked things down, maybe you can go back, 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 all the way to the root of the file system and then see, you know, arbitrary config files underneath. Uh, this totally doesn't work, by the way. You can fire this against Lending Club, nothing's gonna happen. So of course, when it didn't work the first time, unfortunately, they didn't just stop there. They moved into iteration or fuzzing, which is, hey, the first thing didn't work. Let me try a bunch of other things, changing just one little tiny tweak and see what happens. So if this doesn't work, let's try it as a query parameter, which also doesn't work. Let's try it against a PHP file, which totally doesn't exist at Lending Club. No PHP in Lending Club. Also doesn't work. Let's try it as a post instead of a get. This also doesn't work. Uh, let's URL encode the slashes, which doesn't work. Uh, let's add extra slashes, which doesn't work. Uh, let's send the poop emoji, which doesn't work. Let's try this without any dots at all, which doesn't work. So, and I don't even know what this is. So, uh, <laughs> also doesn't work. So at this point, a couple hours in, we had blocked over 34,000 requests from this particular IP address, at which point we said, dude, you're just dead to us. And we blacklisted them. And they kept hitting us about 100,000 more times afterwards, at, maxing out at 93 requests per second, which is actually pretty nice. So remember I said I had three questions. Again, visible, can you see this? If you get an attack like this where someone is fuzzing and trying lots of things over and over again, are you able to see that that's happening? Do you have alerts going off of the velocity? If your WAF is normally blocking 100 things a minute and now it's 100,000, maybe you should know. Garbage. All right, if one IP address over the course of a couple hours has five signature hits, 10, okay, maybe, maybe that's fine. Maybe that's, I don't know, 34,000? That's garbage. Get rid of it. Uh, and can you make things more expensive? One of the things that we do at Lending Club is that when we blacklist an IP, rather than just setting back connection resets the entire time, the behavior is actually identical to what you see if you get a WAF block, which makes it just a little bit more confusing as to whether or not the things that they're trying are going against our blacklist or if they're actually iterating against the WAF. It's a tiny thing, makes it a tiny bit more expensive. It's good to go. All right, next one. And this is my favorite door knocker for like the past six months. Absolute favorite. Came from Croatia. And in order to talk about this, I need to talk about CVE 2017-5638, to which some of you might be thinking, wait a sec, Benjamin, didn't you tell me this was a fundamentals course? Nobody told me I was memorizing CVE numbers. You don't have to. You might actually know this by the more common name of, hey, that Apache struts buggy thing that was used to hack Equifax. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at what, how this works. So Apache Struts had an issue with the multi-part upload parser, and it didn't actually matter if you were using Apache Struts to actually upload files. And the issue kind of came around this bad error handling of the content type or similar headers, and it was, is, a sweet bug. Just straight up remote code execution. All right, so let's walk through how this works. So normally when you're gonna upload a file, the client says, hey, I'm gonna send you a file. Server says, great. And he says, okay, what type of content type? And this client can say, hey, it's an image JPEG. And the server says, great, I know what to do with pictures. Or hey, maybe it's an MP4. And then the server says, hey, I know what to do with that. But if the client's sending them something that they just totally don't understand, the server's gonna say, I have no idea what pizza is. I can't handle this. Error, do not pass go, do not collect $200. The Apache struts attacks worked fairly similarly. It starts out the same, I'm gonna send you a file, great. And then they send a content type header with a bunch of other stuff in it. It includes a little this line here that command equals, in this case, I've said cat Etsy password. And then the server says, error, I have no idea what type of file command cat Etsy password is. And then it would run command cat Etsy password. <laughs> All right, so, 
Let's take a look then at an example Apache Struts thing was Firedance that this came at us from Sweden. Now I have a certain intimacy with this vulnerability, a certain understanding of its nuance that only comes when you get paged at three in the morning and are firing hastily put together curl statements at production going, wait, are we vulnerable to this? Uh, so if what's going on here doesn't immediately jump out to you like it might to me, let me go ahead and bold what I think the important things are here. So first off, we have that command stanza, that command ifconfig. ifconfig is a regular Linux kind of networking, gives you back an IP address, some general network information. And then you got the user agents here, which points back to a GitHub redepo, uh, which tells me that this is actually kind of boring. Uh, this is a script kitty. This is someone doing git clone and run because, quite frankly, Apache Struts exploit attempts are boring. These are shiny graphs from Imperva basically saying, hey, once this became public, we saw it everywhere all the time. For me, if I'm blocking 50 Apache Struts exploit attempts in a day, that's Tuesday. That's boring. So if you're going to be my most favorite door knocking attack in the past six months, you got to go a little bit above and beyond. So. Let's take a look at it. This one is what happened, came from creation. Again, if you don't see what's going on here, let me bold what I think the most important part is. It's right here. Here's the command this guy's trying to run, where they're going to echo into this cron tab something that says, hey, every 20 minutes or so, I want you to w get down this logo.jpg file and pipe it straight into the shell, which of course sparked my curiosity of what the heck is this logo.jpg file. So I fire up a sacrificial VM, go ahead and download it, and surprise, surprise, it's not actually an image. So uh, this is a hastily put together zero formatting or code thing, bad code hygiene, by the way, all cobbled together of a bash script. And being a former system administrator having to take over other people's terribly maintained bash script, I have a formula for this, which is you let's walk through this, actually add some indentation and code stanzas and some commentary to see if I could chunk this out. So that's what I did when I saw this. So. All right, let's take a look at what I think is going on here. So the first step is removing what I think is a previous version of the config file. Remember, the attack is trying to drop something in cron tab that's going to go out and reach for updates every 20 minutes. So if this guy found a better way to do this, then they change their logo.jpg file and clear out old config, start the new stuff. Then it's going to go and list a whole bunch of running processes and look for a lot of different keywords, except for this Tehergasif thing, which we'll see come up later. And anything that might be related to that, we're just going to kill dash nine. Okay, then it's going to see whether or not the process that this guy's trying to start isn't already running, because if it is, then no need to do this again. But if it isn't, all right, then we're going to go forward. So we're going to have this tergosif.comp file. Might be a previous version of there. We're just going to remove it, get rid of it. We're going to download this kworker.comp file uh, into this var temp tergosif and uh, use both curl and wget just in case one of them isn't installed. Uh, and then we're going to make room for this var temp at d space or they're going to slot this binary that's going to be coming on later on. And if I look later down, I see they're removing a var temp sshd. My interpretation of this is that a previous iteration of this, they drop the binary that they want to put on the infected system in Vartemp SSHD, uh, but SSHD taking a whole lot of server resources is kind of suspicious. At D is really similar to the at daemon, which does cron job style things, and it could theoretically be doing a job that's resource intensive. So it's a little bit flying more under the radar. All right, but wait a sec, kworker.com, what the heck is that thing? So of course I go download that, and that is a, a JSON with a little bit of basic configuration. Long username, a third IP address, terrible password. Some of you might, who've been seeing some of these types of attack might know what's going on, but I still didn't at that point. So I fired up a web browser and went to, what's that third IP address? And it says, pool.mineXMR.com something something something. Okay, what's mineXMR.com? Ah, it's a Monero mining pool. Now I have an idea what these guys are doing. So let's take a quick side channel. Let's talk about Monero. So for those of you who may not be familiar with it, Monero is a cryptocurrency that's very similar to Bitcoin. You mine it by using computational power. But there's a couple of things about Monero that make it particularly interesting for attackers. First off, while Bitcoin has a 100% public blockchain where you can see every transaction going back to the beginning of time, Monero obfuscates it. They claim that it's 100% secure. I wouldn't bet my life on it, but they at least take steps in that general direction. 
Also, with Bitcoin, if you're not mining it off GPUs or ASICs, an application-specific integrated chip, you're basically wasting your time. But Monero can still be meaningfully mined through a general purpose CPU. And this leads to a couple of interesting things. So you may have heard of CoinHive. CoinHive is a company that started up, and what they say they're for is to give people an alternative to advertisements. So that instead of doing advertisements, embed this little bit of JavaScript on your page, and anyone who visits you will mine Monero for you in the background. What I see it much more commonly used as is a one-stop quick way to monetize compromised websites. You may have heard about text helps browse aloud. They, text help uh, makes this kind of little JavaScript snippet that you can drop into a website and it will help read out the text of a page. It's really helpful for making sure that your website's accessible to people with visual disabilities. So it's used in a lot of government websites uh, and someone had uh, compromised text helps uh, servers that were serving up that JavaScript. And they didn't change anything with the functionality whatsoever. It would still read out all the text just as you needed, but then they added like four lines that said, oh, and by the way, mine Monero for me. And that was at like 5,000 US and UK government sites. I have a link once you get the slides if you're curious about having more of that. So anyway, we now know what this guy's doing and the rest of this kind of goes a little bit faster now. So this guy's gonna take a look and see whether or not there's the AES encryption set inside my CPU, download a different version of the binary depending on whether or not that instruction set's there. Again, throwing it into Vartemp ATD. And they're not greedy. They're only gonna take a little bit more than 50% of my CPU cores and fire it off and go make me some money. So in all what's going on here from, from head to finish, it's gonna kill any process that it think might possibly be related to another Monero miner. Remember, this script is delivered through literally one of the easiest remote code execution vulnerabilities seen to man. So if this person is able to do it, they think, oh, well, other people might be doing the same thing. They're gonna download a config file to pay to a specific wallet, check the encryption abilities of the CPU, download the right binary, and bam, away you go. Okay, so same three questions. Uh, is it visible? Can you throw it away garbage? And can you make it more expensive? So is it visible? Do you have a WAF? Is it turned on? Is it getting regular signature updates? Most major WAF vendors had an Apache Struts signature available fairly shortly after it became public. But whether or not that signature made it all the way down into people's infrastructure is the difference between being able to see something like this or not being able to see something like this. And, uh, okay, so I have here slight increases in costs due to packed attackers. If you got those in mind, I have a pet peeve of mine. I'm gonna go on a little rant here. Unfortunately, you guys don't have any choice in the matter because I made the PowerPoint slide deck. Let's talk about HTTP host headers, all right? So HTTP host headers, everybody does them. This was the attack that we just looked at. They put an HTTP host header that said host lendingclub.com. Googlebot does it, host lendingclub.com. Curl does it, host, lendingclub.com. Why do they all do this? Well, because it's part of the RFC spec. The HTTP 1.1 technical implementation says everybody's got to send a host header. If you don't send a host header, you're supposed to get back a 400 error, bad request, no cookie for you. And it's so important that they repeat it later in the same RFC. It says, hey, Everybody, it's super important. You should have a host header. And why? Because guess what? It used to be that back in the old days, one host, uh, one IP address just had one host. So you could easily infer what was going on. But now we have IP addresses with lots and lots and lots of hosts. So everybody, please put an HTTP host header. We figured this out in June of 1999, all right? Before we figured out whether or not Y2K was gonna get rid of all of the nice cat pictures on the internet, we had the HTTP host header. Okay, so why am I passionate about this? Why am I, it's so basic. Okay, the number one most active filter in my production traffic in my environment is off the HTTP host header. If someone is coming at me and they either don't have the HTTP host header set or they have it set to an IP address, I don't know what they're doing, but it's garbage and I'm gonna get rid of it. And I block millions of requests in a week. Millions of requests. Let's take a small sampling of this garbage. Let's take a look at this. Host, quad zero, not even an IP address. Even if it was, not one that I control. Oh, look at this. Someone was searching at Bing for Amazon and somehow added at a non-existent PHP MyAdmin setup script. Garbage. 
oh, look at this, cools.php, and we're just gonna add in as a query parameter something to download and run on a machine. Super simple command injection. Of course, once again, I'm curious, so I fire up a sacrificial VM, and I get a Chinese 404 error page. Darn. However, security is a community, and my IP, attacker's IP address shows up in an IOC list in a trend micro blog post. Surprise, it's another Monero miner. So uh, what they found is that the attackers have mined with, oh, look at this, okay, cools.php, Mr. or Mrs. cools.php, with this stupidly simple command injection, made at least $74,000 at least $74,000 as of March of this year. All right, anyway, HTTP host headers, throw away garbage. Uh, and the, the last point here, hey, cryptocurrencies are changing the game. All right, if you go to RSA, you're gonna find a whole bunch of vendors that are gonna say, oh look, we've AI the blockchain to innovate and disrupt all of the things. I don't know anything about that, but I can tell you what the blockchain has disrupted and innovated is the market for attackers changing compromised compute into actual money. It used to be once you compromised a server, you'd have to go steal creds or turn it to a DDoS botnet or do something to us otherwise extort, maybe ransomware. Cryptocurrency, you just need to terribly put together 50 line bash script. All right, so that's nice. Those are all general. Who's actually targeting stuff at us? So here's some stuff with some basic customization. Again, nothing wild here, spear phishing. Somebody looks up what our MX record is, says, oh, guess what? They're doing Office 365. We're gonna give them an Office 365 login page. Take a look at this. Inside, it shows that the uh, credentials then get popped off to another site, and then they reload the actual Microsoft Office 365 legitimate login page so that the user thinks that they've just fat fingered. A similar attack against our employees. Once you figured out we've hit Office 365, it's dead simple to figure out, excuse me, that you just enter in any at lendingclub.com email into the Office 365 sign-in page, you're gonna get directed to OctaSAML. Surprise, not that hard. Uh, and we saw a dictionary-based attack that looks like they use LinkedIn scraping to figure out what the specific valid uh, LendingClub.com emails were, and then we're just kind of using a dictionary attack. And this it, is very identifiable in the logs. Low and slow, so they don't actually lock anything out, but same number of failures across all of them and in the cross same time period, and from Germany, which we don't have any employees there. All right, same questions. Can you see it? Can you get rid of garbage? And can you make anything that's left more expensive? Hey, do you monitor failed employee logins? Do you see when there's a spike? Do you monitor failed MFA changes? Can you see those types of things? Uh, and so to, to paraphrase the Gruck Q here, uh, I think phishing is gonna be something that's gonna be part of everyone's experience until the day we all retire and hand off our problems to somebody else. And I think there's some sort of there's an undertone, perhaps, in some parts of the security community that says, oh, users are dumb, they'll click on anything. And I think the real lesson is, how can you make sure that it's safe for your user to click on anything? Um, and so part of that is, is making it more expensive for attackers. How can you make it so that it's more expensive for your attackers if, let's assume that they're gonna get a valid set of creds, that there's someone somewhere is gonna click on a phishing link, how do you make that more expensive? Uh, add MFA anywhere you know, add restrictions that take a look at whether or not the times and locations and IP address actually make these. Uh, another simple one, uh, do you guys have a blacklist of passwords that people are not allowed to set their password to? You saw that they were using a dictionary style attack. At Lending Club, if you get to your password rotation and you try to enter in the password Lending Club one, no, we're not gonna let you do that. You don't get to do Go Warriors. You don't get to do season plus year. Take what, you, you already know what the word lists are. There's publicly available word lists for dictionary-based attacks that your attackers are using. Take them, drop them in a blacklist, make it so that at least they can't do the very simplest way to guess a password, okay? So those are attacks against my employees. Let's talk about attacks against my customers. Uh, and at the end of the day, oh, no, formatting, great. All of our users have been pwned, all right? Every single one, and if you had a Dropbox account in 2012 or a LinkedIn account in 2012, if you guys haven't heard about haveibeenpwned.com, which I hope most of you in this room have, 
go there, type in your email address. It will tell you every single public breach that your email address was involved with. Won't tell you your password, but just know that whatever password you use for that is already out there. And that leads to this rise of something called credential stuffing, which is I'm going to take the username and password that I know that you used in 2013 Tumblr. Uh, and see whether or not you use that same set of credentials at your Bank of America account. Because guess what? All of our users reuse passwords. All of them, all of the time. And so here's what credential stuffing looks like for us. Uh, multiple countries, multiple IP address, whole bunches of different user agents. But I think the last point is the key one. Again, can you see it? Credential stuffing is a game that's played in the millions. Millions of failed logins. All right, so here's how that looked like. Shiny little Splunk visualization. Who's in Russia doing failed logins? We don't have any customers in Russia. Vietnam, what are you doing with 800,000 failed logins? All right, and we've tried a bunch of different things. Some of them have been less effective than others to, trace, to raise the cost for attackers. Uh, so one of these what, that we tried was, hey, the breaches are out there. We can get a list of the actual usernames and passwords. Let's compare this against our user uh, database, and let's just reset the password for anybody who might have been using that same set of credentials, uh, which kind of worked. Um, there was a depressing number of overlap between us and perhaps some of the other public breaches. Uh, but we're going to get that information a lot slower than the bad guys are. And uh, users kept resetting their passwords back to the compromised creds. So that eh, wasn't so great. Uh, blocking user agents kind of worked a little bit. Like some of these botnets were just standing out like a sore thumb. Hey, who's still running Chrome 23 and why do they have 100,000 failed logins? Maybe they should be dead to us. Uh, but that was still a little bit of a doing a whack-a-mole. Things that we found that were a bit more effective, uh, we're rolling out step-up authentication. So this is not true two-factor with like a time-based one-time password, but it's, hey, you've come to our site, you log in. If it's a device we haven't seen before, we're going to send you an email. you got to click on the link and go through there. Uh, so and unlike a tr perhaps a true pure two-factor, we can force 100% rollout rather than saying, please download the Google Authenticator app and learn what a QR code is and so on and so forth. And then the other, again, visibility, can you see this? Uh, as it says, a credential stuffing is a game played with the numbers in the millions. Right? So if you see a massive, you, massive uptake in failed logins, you know something's going on. Can you see it? All right. So that's what I got. If you want to yell at me and grab slides, uh, contact info is there. There's my Twitter. There's some email. A, so uh, B-Sides is doing this thing with peer lists so that uh, there's never enough time for this Q&A coming afterwards. If there's things that you're curious about, or want to tell me how I'm totally wrong about everything I just set up here, go to that bit.ly link. You'll go to the peer list thing for this particular talk, and you can yell at me all you want there. And that's all I got. Thank you.